Wow. Um, uh, what an honor it is to be able to speak to you today. Um, this, as you'll see, this lecture is really on behalf of all the one million people in the United States who live with type 1 diabetes and the, uh, the probably 10 million around the world. Um, I, I continue to be inspired by them and, and what they uh, live with. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for low-carb nutrition, as you'll hear. Um, I've transitioned to a, to a new position. I'm now the medical director of the McNair Interest, which is a private equity group based here in Houston, though I still have an association with the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, just by way of disclosure, um, I... I have been a consultant for Sanofi and Lexicon. I'm, uh, and again, I'm medical director of this private equity group, which has investments in chronic illnesses, including type 1 diabetes. I have worked as a consultant around um, these SGLT inhibitors. And I'm going to briefly talk about the class in general. I'm not going to talk about the particular compound that I've worked on but you should at least be aware of it. I don't consider this work to be a conflict here, but um, as you'll see, I think that there's some really interesting wrinkles in relationship to low carb and these so-called sodium glucose co-transporters. Type 1 diabetes is a really compelling and challenging problem for people around the world. And this picture is from uh, an amazing book, which is from, it's Michael Bliss, The Discovery of Insulin. And uh, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. Prior to 1922 and 1923, when commercialization became available, children would present to pediatricians like myself, looking like this, with a history of wasting away, drinking a lot of liquid and peeing quite a bit, and weight loss. And there was little that could be done. The primary intervention at the time was a low-calorie, low-carbohydrate nutrition regimen. It was called the Allen diet. And you could extend somebody's life from a few weeks or a few months to a few years, but there was persistent, very serious mortality, and it was essentially unheard of to live with type 1 for decades. So for parents and for pediatricians, it was utterly tragic because you simply watched them and they wasted away. But with the discovery of insulin, there were these really wonderful, miraculous recoveries. And this is the same child after injection of insulin. And, and I, there are many such wonderful examples like that. And if you imagine that this is occurring in 1922 and 23, it makes the achievement all the more amazing. At the time, it was considered a cure for type 1 diabetes. There were ticker tape parades, and there was a general belief that just by injecting this clear liquid, you could go on and live your life. What we now know is insulin is a treatment. It's not a cure for type 1 diabetes. And there's some very serious challenges to living with type 1. So millions of people have type 1 diabetes. <laughs> Injected insulin is the only available therapy. There's one FDA-approved medicine, but it really has achieved very, very low penetrance in the community. Um, be, and that's an injected insulin beyond insulin. So insulin is really all you got. Very high burden of illness. It's challenging to keep blood sugars in the normal range. And there's a risk of excessive weight gain and hypoglycemia with increased insulin. Um, frequent hypoglycemia, low blood sugars, typically one to two episodes per week. But, but many people have very severe episodes of hypoglycemia, life-threatening. And then also a, a serious problem with complications. And uh, there's this major risk of life-threatening complications. And people who live with type 1 diabetes have reduced survival, um, at least by conventional therapies. And I'm going to show you some of that. We know now that tight control imparts better long-term survival. And that's important because it means that... Uh, Healthcare providers like us and families and the people who live with type 1 can do a lot to try to live and have a, have a great life. But unfortunately, it also puts a lot of pressure on all of us. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't believe that the healthcare system has really been able to meet this demand. And what you see is a lot of unmet need and the vast majority of people who live with type 1 diabetes don't have great 
uh, diabetes control, just because it's so hard. And again, I'm going to elaborate on that. Anybody who lives with type 1 diabetes has another problem, which I'm going to mention, which is that there's a lot of hope that someday the, the disease uh, state will someday be transformed. And you could call this a cure or a definitive therapy. And uh, it's very frustrating for people with type 1. They'll often be sent emails from loved ones. Hey, I heard about this. Somebody's got some new stem cell. What do you think about this? And sadly, the reality is there's this ever-receding horizon that hasn't been able, that they haven't been able to reach. And I'm going to talk to you about the basic science. I think uh, definitive therapies or cures are a very long way off. Decades, I would be surprised if I live long enough to see them. So when will basic science knowledge translate to improved outcomes? And uh, uh, sadly, the answer is, I don't know. And the person who definitively looks you in the eye and gives you an answer is merely showing their ignorance and, frankly, arrogance. It's a long and winding road in between the mouse and the millions of people who live with type 1. And there's a lot of different ideas that have been trotted out, including beta cell regeneration, making more of these insulin-secreting cells, or stem cell therapy, making a new cell magically from some cell that, that secretes insulin, or immunotherapies to find some way to induce lasting, permanent immunologic tolerance so that the immune system doesn't destroy the pancreas, doesn't destroy the ability to make insulin. And then advanced technologies. Maybe you could just get some sort of insulin robot that would measure glucose and administer insulin. All four of these modalities are a long ways off, and I'm going to go into each of them in my talk. And I'm, gonna, I'm using this discussion about basic science as a way to illustrate how I found myself such a low-carb uh, devotee. So how, what's the adaptive beta cell response to type 1 diabetes? Well, in my other life, I've been a basic scientist studying how type 1 diabetes occurs, the pathophysiology of the disease. And we've um, really been interested in trying to understand this both in healthy pancreas as well as in, in, in uh, samples that have type 1, because we want to know, is there any hint of regeneration? Are there cells that are trying to grow and make more cells in order to fill a reservoir and allow a person who lives with type 1 to live a medication-free life? And so the way we'd, we've done this is by looking at these cadaveric specimens. So these are brain-dead organ donors. Um, and th there's a, a, a center at the University of Florida run by a bunch of brilliant scientists, including my dear friend, Dr. Mark Atkinson, and they've collected pancreata from organ donors, some of whom are non-diabetic and some of whom have type 1 diabetes. And you can see on the right that type 1 diabetic uh, islet is very, very different from the islet, the islands of Langerhans, that, uh, on the left in the, in the non-diabetic. You see right away there are very few of these insulin-secreting cells. There are other hormone-containing cells but there's a profound deficiency in insulin-secreting cells. And moreover, when we look for regeneration, we simply don't see it. And so this is a paper that my lab published um, only a, a little over a year ago, and we found no evidence of new cells and no evidence of cells that are turning into other cells. And our general take on it is that the pancreas is pretty static in people who are living with long-standing type 1. There's no attempt to make new cells. And I'm very worried about this finding because it suggests that any medicine that we come up with will be trying to amplify a process that exists in nature, and we don't see that process at all. So I'm fearful that beta cell regeneration, some new tool to make more beta cells, may be a, a really serious, elusive goal. What about stem cells? Well, this is a, this is a somewhat vulgar a headline from the Times of London, and it describes diabetes, a cure at last. And that would be wonderful if it were true, but this was really just about selling newspapers, not about communicating advances. It describes an important scientific advance that I'm going to go into. It's about a, a scientist who's been a hero and friend and mentor of mine, Dr. Douglas Melton, and he's actually the parent of two children with type 1 diabetes. But unfortunately, once the research gets out there and the general lay public, it gets amplified, and there's sort of a race to the, 
to, to the lowest common denominator. And in this case, the Times of London wins. So the idea is to, is to create these insulin secreting cells from pluripotent stem cells. And again, there's a paper from, from Dr. Douglas Melton. There's another one from Dr. Tim Kiefer. I, I know them both well. It's very exciting that you could make, take stem cells and turn them into insulin secreting cells if that were true. And the idea was now we can just make buckets of them and we're ready to go and we'll find some magic place to put them and then we'll cure type 1 diabetes. Cool. But as it turns out, it's much harder than that. And so what did they do? They, they described a series of steps to take these human embryonic stem cells or these so-called iPS cells and turn them into insulin secreting cells. They also got some other hormone-containing cells. And then the idea is to take these cells and stick them in a mouse. And that is a diabetic mouse. And they found that it rescued glucose homeostasis. So the mouse was theoretically cured of diabetes. They still had some glucose intolerance and other things. So if that were true, that's very exciting. But unfortunately, if you take these cells and you stick them in a dish, you see they behave very differently than human islets. So this is what human islets look like. They have very low basal insulin secretion. And then when you expose them to glucose, they make a bunch of insulin. So they have a dynamic capacity. They go from very low insulin to a whole bunch of insulin. And now we take these cells that came from the stem cell. They have very high basal secretion and very little glucose response. And so what this really says is that we haven't reached the finish line, not even close. And there's a lot that we need to know about cellular engineering in order to make these limitless beta cells. And by the way, we have no clue where we would put these cells. And you'd have to find a way to protect them from the immune system. And um, unfortunately, the immune system is going to continue to destroy them. So we wrote uh, an editorial that was published in Cell Stem Cell about this. And we really do believe that, it, that these, two, these papers represent two steps forward. But now it's a time to pause and continue to hunker down and focus on the science. Because it, it may take decades or centuries to get to the answer, but we have to be rigorous about how we approach it. Okay, what happens about the immune system? Well, could you, take, could you create new immunotherapies to preserve beta cell function? Unfortunately, the answer is no. So this is the best trial to date. These are using these immunologic poisons. This is something called ATG CSF. And, and they're taking people who have relatively recent onset type 1 diabetes and infusing either a poison or nothing and then following them over time. And the primary outcome measure is, hem is a C peptide, the ability to make insulin on your own. And what you see is that the ability to make insulin declines as a function of time after the treatment. And moreover, both curves, both the control group in the gray and the, and, the, uh, inter, and the group that's had the intervention in the black have a decline, and the curves are parallel. So you can temporarily delay the destruction of the beta cell, but you cannot permanently re-educate, not at this time with the medicines that we have. You can't create permanent, lasting tolerance. And we can't administer these drugs chronically because you're taking somebody with a healthy immune system and you're basically shutting down their immune system. That wouldn't work. So we're, there's a long ways to go with the immune system uh, research, and I don't know. We're, we're not there yet. What are the outcomes for typically treated type 1 diabetes? Well, they're not great, and this is probably the best possible outcome. So this is not representative of the U.S. general population. These are elite clinics. These are people who... Um, uh, the pediatric clinics are fairly standard. This is probably a pretty healthy selection. This is from the T1D exchange. And so on the left, you see uh, teenagers and young adults in the middle. And on the right are 26 to 50 and age 50 and above. For typical adults, the hemoglobin A1C is in the mid-7. There's two different age cohorts. There's this cohort that's in brown and another one that's in blue. And what you'll notice is that the control is getting worse. Despite the knowledge that we have a lot of unmet need, Despite all of our efforts to come up with creative new ways to support people with diabetes, like continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps, we're actually losing ground. We're not gaining it. Moreover, this, um, this population is rather elite and sophisticated. The people who are receiving health care in these adult clinics are going to academic medical centers. They're probably much more likely to be wealthy and have resources than people who are are out there 
with no health insurance. So my fear is that the real average hemoglobin A1C in the United States for people with type 1 diabetes is upwards of 8 or 8.5%. Eight so hold that thought. There's excessive cardiovascular death and typically treated type 1. This comes from the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, it's really a pretty scary paper. And I don't bring this here to scare you all. I, I tend to be relentlessly optimistic and positive, but it's important for us to understand what our therapies are doing. And the reality is, if most people end up with a hemoglobin A1C somewhere in between 7.9 and 8.7, their risk of death from any cause, at least according to this cohort, is 3.11 fold control population. And cardiovascular death is 4.44. So vastly increased risk of death, which says to me that there's a lot of unmet need and we've got to do better. You'll also notice that the lower the A1C, the better the numbers. So that's exciting and it suggests that the better we do to support people with type 1 diabetes, the more they can lower their risk. So why is it so hard to effectively treat type 1 diabetes with insulin? Because I haven't really said that and it's not exactly clear from the outside. Like, why don't you just give more, right? So a, a brief tour of glucose homeostasis. So this is, um, this is an islet, and we know it secretes insulin, and it goes and acts upon the skeletal muscle, and it tells glucose to enter the skeletal muscle. And then there's also an action upon the liver, and that, that suppresses hepatic gluconeogenesis, the production of glucose from the liver. And then there's also insulin that comes and acts upon the fat, and it ultimately drives glucose into fat, and it makes more fat cells. So this is normal glucose homeostasis when the system is working properly. Now let's take this and let's substitute a defective islet and very little insulin. And now let's inject insulin crudely with a guesstimate of how much insulin we think we might need for a meal. In this case, Snackwell's cookies. <laughs> Fat free. <laughs> Well, Snackwell's cookies are essentially pure carbohydrate. And so um, they got a ton of sugar. You'll have a huge glucose load. You require a ton of insulin to drive that glucose into skeletal muscle. You'll require a ton of insulin to act upon, oh, excuse me. You, let me make my animation work right. So you have a ton of glucose. You have a ton of insulin that drives that glucose into skeletal muscle. In addition, you have quite a bit of insulin acting upon the, uh, the liver, because the glucose is very, very high, and the feedback pathways are driving that there. And similarly, in the fat, a lot of insulin, very high glucose, a lot of adipogenesis, and ultimately, fat cell growth. And so people tend to gain weight on carbohydrates with type 1 diabetes, because you can't faithfully recapitulate the normal physiology that exists uh, in, in a non-type 1 person, in a healthy person. And unfortunately, the standard guidelines for people with type 1 diabetes emphasize carbohydrates. So this is an information sheet from a, from a, a typical uh, large children's hospital. And what you see in this case, if you have a, uh, a, a boy, male, not age 9 to 13, requires 1,700 kcals per day, uh, breakfast 60 grams, carbohydrates 75 grams for lunch, 15 for snack, 75 for dinner, and 15 at bed. Um, and again, that's a 10-year-old who might weigh only, say, uh, 35 kilograms. Okay, so, so what are we talking about? So we're going to inject some insulin. We need some long-acting, this basal insulin that's, that's required to, to, uh, to, to cover the needs of the liver and basal metabolism. And then you're going to consume 60 grams of carbohydrates, and you're going to take an insulin bolus. And then you're going to consume 75, and you take an insulin bolus. And then you're going to consume 105 and take four units. And the idea goes, if you do this correctly and faithfully, and you pay very, very close attention your blood sugar should basically be perfect. And so there's an ideal range. And so what you would expect that there'd be a little bit of oscillation and blood sugars would essentially be normal. So goes the myth. 
The reality is something darker than that. And part of the reason is there's just a ton of variation or slop in these calculations. And it's impossible to precisely determine the number of carbohydrates in each meal, the contribution of fat in that meal, and also just the day-to-day -day physiology. And even the insulin injection sites themselves vary in efficiency. So whereas we say you're giving two units, in reality, the physiologic impact of that injection could be a unit and a quarter or three because you have so much other variation. Okay. And as a result, you can get wild excursions where the blood sugars go high and low, and it's really just a serious recurring problem. And this is what it looks like. So this is an 18-year-old who's had type 1 diabetes for more than 10 years. She's on a high-carb day, and you can see her blood sugars are in this wild roller coaster. And you can say, well, what's the big deal? Her blood sugars are, are maybe okay, uh, but an a average of 200 is an A1C is sort of in the mid-8s. But also imagine what it's like to be on that downward slope of the roller coaster and to see your continuous glucose monitor tracing showing that you are literally on a roller coaster and it looks like you're going to plummet into the ground. And you know that if you hit the ground, you might go unconscious. It's terrifying. It's exhausting. It's overwhelming. And the cognitive burden, the sort of load of thought that's devoted to type 1 diabetes is enormous and outrageous. And so people feel a true sense of burden because they have to look at their watch or their, even if they have these fancy tools, they have to look at their glucose all the time and try to figure out where they are and whether they're going to crash or not. And by the way, only a small fraction of people are even on CGM. Most people would never even get this data. They just check two or three or four times a day and that's it. And around the world, most people don't check at all. This is in the this is in millimoles for the, for those in, outside the U.S. Okay, so why advise people with type one diabetes to eat a, a low fat carbohydrate based diet? And this has been around for a long, long time, and I've wondered this. And if you read the standards of medical care, for instance, this this in diabetes, they say limited research exists concerning the ideal amount of fat for individuals with diabetes. That is most definitely true. And they say that the Institute of Medicine has defined an acceptable macronutrient distribution range, or AMDR, for all adults for total fat of 20 to 35 percent of energy with no tolerable upper intake level to fund. So they say roughly 20 to 35 percent of energy. And this AMDR was, it was based on evidence for coronary heart disease risk. And I'm going to go into this in a bit. So what is this AMDR? It's from the so-called DRI. It's from the Institute of Medicine, now renamed the National Academy of Medicine. It's published in 2002. It's a PDF. You can get it online for free. It's 400 pages. It's filled with amazing, sophisticated people who have written about each of their pet uh, macronutrients. And so there are chapters from the world experts talking about the need for carbohydrate or for protein or for fat and integrating this in, in various human phys physiologic conditions. It's quite sophisticated. It's, it's certainly not to be dismissed. If you read it, and I have, what you see is that over and over again, they say it does not apply to disease states. It's intended for healthy populations. So first of all, they say it doesn't apply to disease states. Moreover, they have a very bizarre way of making their overall arguments. And I want to take you through what they say. They say that if you eat too many carbohydrates, you're going to have decreased high-density lipoproteins, you're going to have increased triglycerides, you're going to have increased LDL particles, and you're going to have increased cardiovascular risk. So don't, they say, don't eat too many carbohydrates. Okay. But they say, if you eat too much fat, you're going to have increased dietary energy because fat is calorically dense. And therefore, you're going to gain weight. And therefore, you will be consuming more saturated fat. And therefore, you'll have increased cardiovascular risk. And so they argue that these two extremes must be balanced. And what they pick is something in the middle, based on the apparent risk for coronary heart disease that may occur on low-fat diets and the risk for increased energy intake and therefore obesity with the consumption of high-fat diets. They pick a number in the middle. And this is the number. So it's very bizarre, and this number is 
ultimately in lookup tables in the back of the document. And so somebody who goes to, uh, uh, un to get an undergraduate or doctorate degree in nursing, all of the textbooks are based on the lookup tables from this document. And the, and the numbers were simply chosen as an average in between two extreme values. And so it's like in choosing in between white and black, they chose 18% gray. It doesn't make any sense, but that's why we eat what we eat. This is the predominant lo logic that is forcing us to consume 45 to 65% of our macronutrients from carbohydrates. It's totally bizarre. It doesn't make any sense. And I wondered, well, do dietary fats influence human health? And um, it, the argument actually is, yeah, probably not. And I think this is, a, this is really a beautiful meta-analysis that describes that there's no relationship in between saturated fat intake and, and overall mortality. It's really surprising and should make you think, and it's based on thousands and thousands of patients, there might be a relationship between trans fats. Thankfully, these are, being, these are industrial trans fats, like Crisco. These are, these are definitely coming out of the food stream. Interestingly, ruminant trans fats are somewhat neutral. So ruminant trans fats are the trans fats that come from ruminant animals. Um, and moreover, ruminant trans fats appear to be protective for type 2 diabetes. And delicious. And delicious. Yeah. <laughs> so the, this is not an RCT. This is merely an observation. It's associative. But it said to me that whatever fear we had about the consumption of saturated fat and total fat may, be, uh, may not be fully founded. So innovative dietary interventions for type 1 diabetes? Well, Dr. Richard Bernstein has been a pioneer in this field for decades. He's an amazing person. He's in his 80s. He lives with type 1 diabetes. He went to medical school after he got type 1 diabetes and learned to treat it with, with a low-carb approach. And he still has a practice to this day uh, in Westchester County in New York. He's truly a pioneer. And this book is fabulous. It's not just about type 1 diabetes. It's also type 2. He uses a low-carb, high-protein approach. And, he, and there's some brilliant uh, pearls in there. One of the most important is the so-called rule of small numbers that says if you consume less carbohydrate, you need less insulin. And less insulin is less chance to be able to make an error around your insulin dosing. So what does it look like? Well, this is my friend Marshall. I, I've known him since he was a little kid. He, he's a father of, of three boys. He has type 1 diabetes. And, you know, he's got some smoked salmon, and he's got some avocado, and he's got some low-carb bread and some aioli, and that's quite typical for him. And um, as you can see, these, these meals really don't drive up his blood sugars. His sugars are very normal quite often. He's able to routinely do this. It's quite impressive. Um, and so what are, you, what are you actually doing? Well, again, you can't get rid of your insulin. You still got to take long-acting insulin. Without that, people with type 1 diabetes would almost immediately go into diabetic ketoacidosis. But instead of, instead of those uh, Mongo carb meals, they take a little bit of protein. 20, 25, 30 grams of protein per meal, which means a very small dose of insulin. And a small dose of insulin means that there's less chance to get off course with your blood glucose. And the blood glucose typically oscillates in a range that's very much close to normal in these folks. It's really exciting. And so you can have these blood sugar tracings that are, frankly, near normal. And it's utterly transformative for somebody who lives with type 1 because they're used to living on this crazy roller coaster, and all of a sudden things are just smooth. And when you talk to people about low carb and type 1, the thing they describe the most is that it reduced the burden of living with it. They just get to feel better. They feel more human. They feel like they're able to live their lives and do the things they love. And they still have diabetes. You still got to think about it. But all of that intolerable up and down and fear and anxiety starts to fade away. And I'm just so thrilled about that because ultimately the most important biomarker for me is not hemoglobin A1C or average blood glucose or something else. It's how do you feel? Okay, so I showed you this glucose tracing of the 18-year-old on a high-carb day. 
this is the same person on a low carb day. And so really a dramatic difference. If I flip back and forth, you see that the glucose excursions that were going up really high, in this case up to 400, are way, way down. And this is very close to what we in the type 1 world call a no-hitter, where you can keep your blood glucose in, in the desired range all day long. Um, and I have uh, close friends who, before low-carb, had never had a no-hitter. Not one. Not one. Okay. Here's a 23-year-old with type 1 diabetes for 12 years. Here, uh, on a high-carb day with a lot of excursions and pretty scary. And also, you'll notice uh, these little C marks. He, uh, he's calibrating because he's fearful maybe there's, there's something wrong with his glucometer, but he's discovering he really is in trouble. And he's got a lot of glucose flux. And uh, the same person on a low-carb day. So oscillations, but much, much smaller, much safer, much more comfortable. Really exciting. Tiny standard deviations. Here's a 22-year-old with type 1 diabetes for a year who's been on low-carb since diagnosis. Very strictly following a low-carb plan, also uh, exercising quite a bit. And um, blood sugars that are essentially near perfect. And it makes me wonder whether going on a low-carb approach at diagnosis, especially if you're in your late teens or you're an adult, might allow you to preserve your beta cell function, might allow either slow down the immune system destruction or alternatively allow those residual beta cells to just work a little bit better because they don't have to face toxic hyperglycemia all the time. And we need to test this, and ultimately, there are ways to do this. The um, U.S. federal government has something called TrialNet, and they could very easily do a keto trial for new onset type one. There's no money in it, and so and and so it's it's going to be a lo little bit different. It's going to work against a lot of established uh, stakeholders. Uh, typically, this is these kinds of clinical trials are around immunologic poisons, not necessarily around people who are selling beef and butter and kale. <laughs> okay, so does low-carb synergize with automated insulin delivery? Um, this is really interesting, maybe. So Adrian LXM is a nickname of a guy who's, an, who's a developer who has type 1 diabetes. Um, actually, he has a genetic form of type 1 diabetes called Modi. And uh, he is making insulin on an auto loop. So he's programmed his Android phone to control his insulin pump. And um, this is him on a high-carb approach. And this is several days. So the time scale is compressed. And what you're looking at is a bunch of days on that very short graph. So you'll notice that there's a bunch of very bright spikes. That doesn't mean his blood sugar is flashing between 400 and, and 50 all day long. It's more that we're seeing the, the tracings over the course of uh, three days. So again, this is a high-carb approach, and this is the best that this very sophisticated device can do. The device measures his glucose and administers insulin, and even so, it's incapable of routinely controlling blood sugars. And on a low-carb approach, he's basically flat all the time. His blood sugars are normal. So that's shocking and amazing, and it suggests to me that if we're able to build Approaches where we have both automated insulin delivery and low carb, people could see their glucose flux go to essentially non-diabetic ranges. And that's not far off. There are a couple of pumps that can do things that sort of look like this, but though they're not quite. Uh, one, there's one that's FDA approved that's really struggling because of a, a bunch of defective sensors. Um, there's another one that can shut insulin off if you're low and going lower. And that might work very well with low-carb or keto. But again, there will be more of these over time, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that there will be synergy between low-carb and technology. Um, thankfully, there has been some research. For years, there was no research. And now, finally, finally, there's research. And so there's this wonderful paper that was, that was published by David Ludwig and many, many others. And, and Dr. Westman is a, is a co-author on this as well. And Aaron Rhodes and Carl Everling and R.D. Dykeman. And R.D. Dykeman uh, created a Facebook group called Type 1 Grit. And these are followers of Dr. Richard Bernstein's approach. And it's a place, it's a private, closed Facebook group that's comprised of 
3,000 people who have type 1 or are, um, have loved ones with type 1 or providers, I'm a member as well, uh, who just want to learn about this low-carb approach. And uh, you can see that the reported mean hemoglobin A1c in this group is 5.67% with a standard deviation of 0.66. So that's awesome, right? It's really great. And it's inconceivable on standard therapies. You just can't achieve that. Well, um, this has generated a lot of excitement, including an article in the New York Times, and uh, which, which quoted Andrew Hightower. This is Lester's son, <laughs> which is amazing. There's, there's Lester in the back. And Andrew likes pizza and sandwiches and dessert, and he can still have those things on a low-carb approach, but you've got to be creative about it. He can't just wander into any restaurant or any fast food joint, but he can still live a healthy life. And moreover, there are enormous benefits, which uh, the article describes, that he recognizes for himself. And I, again, I, I would argue that uh, carbohydrate restriction for type 1 diabetes is ultimately liberating. Well, there's been some there's been some pushback, uh, some pretty serious pushback. <laughs> and so these are some of the leaders in the in the type one diabetes field. They include uh, Beth Meyer Davis and Lori LaFell and John Buse. These are established experts in the type one diabetes world, and they say that although it may be true that a very low carbohydrate diet can be useful, we find the study. To, to fall well short of the level of scientific evidence that merits the media and professional attention it seems to have garnered. And the online community was not a general type 1 diabetes community. Rather, this was a community following a specific kind of diet. And we suspect that only individuals who believe in this approach, as promoted by the authors, would be in the community and respond to the survey. So promulgating such methodologically weak although enticing data broadly through the media creates a risk that patients and, or providers may pursue such plans without adequate insulin adjustment, resulting in serious issues with hypoglycemia, as well as a risk of nutritional deficiencies. And so they're sort of, it's a lot of scaremongering. And David Ludwig writes back and says, well, they criticize the media attention of our study, but we don't think that suppressing information is a good idea. <laughs> A hundred years ago, before the discovery of insulin, low-carb was the typical approach, and it was quite effective. Uh, and sometimes it takes patient advoca advocacy uh, to stimulate research into neglected treatments. And a low-carb low uh, uh, diet for diabetes may be one such area. And if the media attention surrounding our study helps stimulate the research, it will have done a public health service. So I'm really excited about that. It's a, it's a generous response, and it shows that everybody's eager to try to find a better way. So would low-carb nutrition violate consensus guidelines? Actually, no. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Maybe if you go to the ISPAD guidelines, that's the International Society of Pediatric Diabetes, they say, yes, there's international agreement that carbohydrates should not be restricted in children and adults with type 1 diabetes that may result in deleterious effects on growth. So this is very hardcore, and uh, they want you to simply follow that. And they, and they, write, they say that the fat should be 20, uh, 30 to 35%. But if you look at the American Diabetes Association, which is a more up-to-date guideline, it gives much more wiggle room. And they say that the studies examine the ideal amount of carbohydrate intake for people with diabetes are inconclusive. That's cool, right? Because where there is uncertainty, there should be room for self-experimentation. And it's important to quote this anytime you happen to encounter a healthcare provider in the context of type 1 who's demanding that you follow a particular regimen because there is quite a bit of wiggle room in the guidelines. The ideal amount of dietary fat for individuals with diabetes is controversial. They're giving us room. And they say data on the ideal total dietary fat intake for people with diabetes are inconclusive. Okay, so we got some room. They recommend Mediterranean diet. Okay, whatever. Fine. <laughs> And here's another one from Diabetes Care. Evidence suggests that there's not an ideal percentage of calories 
from carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So this, these are important statements that I'm gonna, I, I've tried to show you over and over again, but I, because I want to emphasize that people who provide false certainty about macronutrient distributions are not up to date with the latest recommendations. And if you want to customize macronutrient distributions for a particular condition, you have the room according to the American Diabetes Association. This doesn't go off the rails. And, and again, they say macronutrient distribution should be individualized. <laughs> right? So they're not endorsing or prescribing low carb, but at least they give room for it. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Would low carbohydrate nutrition cause hypoglycemia? Well, yeah, if you, do it, if you don't do it right. So again, I showed you this high carb, high bolus uh, regimen. And if you did that and you got into trouble with fixed insulin doses and instead you gave just protein and these big whacking doses of insulin, you're going to get in terrible trouble and your blood sugars are going to go low. So you better adjust because people with type 1 diabetes administer insulin for carbohydrate. And if you reduce your carbohydrate, you need less insulin. Um, it's, it's just that simple. And moreover, if you don't do that, you will go low and then you'll have to have rescue carbs and you'll have these crazy sine wave blood sugars. But um, the obvious thing to do is to adjust insulin doses for glycemic load, and that's really quite straightforward, and it can be done fairly simply and successfully once you get the hang of it. And people who do this are able to get uh, blood sugars that really sit in the normal range much of the time, again, with glucoses that are sitting, you know, oscillating somewhere between near normal and near normal. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, any advice for people interested in low-carbohydrate nutrition? Well... Continuous glucose monitoring, you got to have a CGM. It's very hard to do this without CGM. I understand that many people um, are resource limited. The stuff is expensive now. There are people who have learned to do this using the um, Freestyle Libre, which is less expensive than the Dexcom, and you can hack it to get continuous readings. Uh, but I think it, CGM really makes an enormous difference because if you don't know your glucose flux, you can't intervene to improvement to approve it. And many people have this hidden flux within their system and they're going high and low all the time and they just got no clue because they're only checking blood sugars like two or three or four times a day. And so all this cryptic variation might be present and you've got to look at it in order to understand it to then act and intervene. And CGM is really essential for this. Treat protein with insulin. It, this is actually quite important. So if you just go low carb, I'm going to cut the carbs out, but then I have like a 10 ounce piece of salmon. Um, the problem is all of that protein will turn to insulin. So, so it turns to glucose and requires insulin. And the ratio is a little bit complicated. So if you simply emit the boluses and you have protein meal after protein meal after protein meal, the typical story is you go higher and higher and higher. And the problem is there, it does turn to glucose on a, about a, a 0.6 ratio and the kinetics are delayed. It takes quite a bit of time to ultimately turn into glucose, and it gets very confusing for people with type 1. So what's the obvious answer? Again, 10 grams of, glu of, uh, 10 grams of protein, 6 grams of extended carbs, small extended boluses of insulin. You can use regular insulin. You can use a square wave on a pump. And this is one of these, your mileage may vary. It takes real time and energy to do this. Bernstein writes about this in an expert manner in his book. Lots of other folks have written about this. This process of plan, do, study, act, looking at your sugars, thinking about what's happening, trying to find a new way to do things, what, what, what Deming calls this, this sort of classic engineering cycle to make stuff better and systems work better is incredibly important for type 1 diabetes. Watch out for euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. What am I talking about? These are these drugs we were talking about. So these are these sodium glucose co-transporters, and they are associated with diabetic ketoacidosis. And it's pretty scary. And moreover, the blood sugars are typically normal. So pe these, these are typically people on type, on, uh, who have type 1 diabetes, and if they have nausea, sorry, this is a Mac PC thing, and you barf, that's what those, the, those little emojis are. Um, and let's say you wake up in the morning and you vomit. One thing you have to be concerned about is the possibility that your insulin stopped infusing the night before, and now you're in, you're in deep trouble. Maybe you forgot to take a shot, or your insulin catheter is plugged, 
Well, what do you do? You have type 1 diabetes, you check your sugar, right? And you're, and you're looking for elevated blood glucose. And that's, uh, so you're saying, okay, the primary biomarker for life-threatening insulin deficiency is elevated glucose. If I wake up in the morning, I have type 1 diabetes, and I wake up and I'm nauseous, the first thing I do is check my sugar. Is my insulin pump working? Is there some problem? And so, again, glucose is the primary biomarker for life-threatening insulin deficiency. But if you're on an, a super potent glucose-lowering agent, well, now you've got a problem because um, you can have blood glucose that can be near normal. And this is probably also true of people who are on extreme keto, very, very, very low-carb diets. And there's sort of a cognitive dissonance that occurs where you have a real problem with insulin, and you go to check your sugar, but it's not as elevated as you would have expected. And my, my suspicion is that there's a delay in getting to the hospital or acting in a definitive manner. And how do you reverse decay? It's very simple, carbohydrate um, and, and lots and lots of insulin. And by the way, you should be measuring beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is incredibly helpful. And if you measure ketones, you would, of course, find that the ketones are elevated in extreme insulin deficiency. And so it's really important to check for ketones. Um, and so a ketone meter, beta-hydroxybutyrate, this is the Keto Mojo, but there are several others on the market. And you should be looking not just, there's no absolute value, you're looking for an elevation over time in beta-hydroxybutyrate, indicating that you have a, um, a, this uh, a insulin deficiency. So again, I want to drive this home. Glucose may not be a reliable biomarker for life-threatening insulin deficiency when in nutritional ketosis, similar to people with type 1 diabetes who take SGLT2 inhibitors. <laughs> How common is this? Not common at all. But we will see cases of this, I promise you. We will see people who are on extreme keto, who have some problem with a the pump, their sugar never got elevated to the point where they were concerned, and, and, and things were confusing for a while. And we need to start to be aware of this. And I've heard at least anecdotal reports from friends. Okay. Well, beware of hypoglycemic unawareness with ultra low carb. If you're in nutritional ketosis and your beta hydroxybutyrate oscillates in between one and two, and you're like really in a hardcore keto state, and for some reason, you, for some particular reason, your blood sugar goes low and stays low, you may not be aware of it. I have a friend, he called me up, and he goes, he goes, hey, Dr. G, guess what my blood sugar is? I said, what? He goes, 25. <laughs> I said, what? He goes, yeah, my blood sugar is 25, but I feel fine. And I said, take some carbs. He's like, but I'll, I'll get out of ketosis. <laughs> And so what's happening is he's in such hardcore ketosis that his brain has shifted over to consuming fat as a macronutrient instead of carbohydrate, and now he's not vulnerable to variations in glucose. This is described by George Cahill and others decades ago, and you could argue that that's a good thing because he's protected from, from, from hypoglycemia, but you could also argue that the difference in between where his blood sugar was when he called me up and a, and a fatal low was very small. And I don't know that, but I can say that it's important to, to, to be on a CGM if you're in nutritional ketosis, or at least be aware that there is this issue you may be um, unaware of, of low blood glucose. So CGM may be essential to detect cryptic hypoglycemia within people with type 1 diabetes who are in nutritional ketosis. We have to be aware of this. You've got to start talking about this. I want to make sure we don't lose patients. Okay, resources for low-carb, high-fat nutrition. Uh, Dr. Bernstein's book, he's awesome. It's great. <laughs> he's the pioneer, for sure. And he's uh, like 84 and still going strong. Um, Adam Brown has written a terrific book on type 1 diabetes. Uh, I highly recommend this. It's not just type 1, it's also type 2. And there's just a bunch of health and wellness tips around exercise and living with diabetes. And he speaks about it from the perspective of somebody who has diabetes himself. And it's, it's a great book. I, I, I would love to see this handed out to every person diagnosed with, with, with type 1. It's just that good. Um, 
I spoke about Type 1 Grit, this closed Facebook group. There's two pages. There's the one that you can see in the community without being a member of, and then there's the closed one, and you have to apply to be the closed one, and in some way touched by Type 1 diabetes. Either be a, have a loved one who has Type 1, or be a, a healthcare provider, or live with it yourself. There's this paper, uh, which is terrific, and so this is, this is Jessica Turton's paper, Low Carbohydrate Diets for, for Type 1 Diabetes, a systematic review. This is published in PLOS One. It's great. And then there's also a really great overall review of dietary carbohydrate restriction as the first approach in diabetes management, Cri critical review and evidence-based. Both of these articles are terrific. Just highly recommend them, okay? Um, and that's really it. How are we going to advance low carb for type 1 diabetes? Support low carb research funding and better studies. Advocate for better nutrition standards. We need to recruit adult type 1 diabetes peers to volunteer uh, in diabetes clinics because they bring culture and grounding to the experience to make sure that healthcare providers are really thinking about serving the needs of people like them. Um, foster psychology collaborations to test the impact of nutrition on mental health. I think low carb will be very beneficial, but I want definitive studies. I really would like hardcore proof. Um, we need to increase access to continuous glucose monitors and ketone testing, advocacy, mentoring, stewardship, and local reinforcement. I can't say this enough. This meeting here today is by a group of people who are highly motivated to support each other around low carb and nutrition and diabetes. And you will go out and you'll tell 10 more friends and this movement will spread. And here's a wonderful example of this. This is actually uh, a potluck dinner that happened uh, comprised of people who follow type 1 grit who have are in some way touched by type 1 diabetes. And kids and families are together and we're sharing low-carb recipes and supporting each other. And one of these events is happening this afternoon at my friend Sharon's house. And well, Lester's going to be there. Yeah, Awesome. So that's all I have. Thanks so much.